I come now to my third part on my series on the Federal Vision, actually as we go through and kind of survey the Joint Federal Vision Statement uh, that was developed out of the Auburn Avenue Conference several years ago, uh, on which document we find names like Douglas Wilson and Peter Lightheart, among several others. And we come to this third and final part uh, that is going to really be where I, I get to discuss baptism, law, gospel, distinction, and justification. And actually, we're not discussing baptism in this part as a result of, you know, wanting to go to bat against paedo-baptism or anything like that. That's not the purpose of this podcast. I want to discuss language that the statement subsumes under the subheading of baptism. So we're going to look at that. Uh, if you guys have not had an opportunity to watch the first two parts of this series, I would encourage you to go back and watch those parts before you get to this third one here. Uh, otherwise, uh, hopefully this content is enjoyable, helpful. Uh, I want it to be helpful. I want it to be clarifying. I don't want it to be ped pedantic. I don't want it to be overly polemical. I just want to interact with the Federal Vision Statement because it seems like this issue uh, comes back around every couple of years or so and becomes a, a big deal every couple of years. Uh, recently with theology proper debates uh, and and law gospel debates going at the same time, these are issues that both that both come up in the uh, Joint Federal Vision Statement and that exist um, at a popular level. And so I thought it would be helpful to go through the statement. Anyway, if you haven't watched parts two, one and two, uh, go back and do that before watching this part here, part three, and this is our final part. So let's go ahead and jump into it again. I said this was on baptism, the law gospel distinction, and how the statement seems to envision the law gospel distinction. And then we're going to look at the doctrine of justification we're going to, when we get to the doctrine of justification, we're going to look at something helpful with regard to justifying faith in Herman Witsius, which I think he has some helpful uh, distinctions to make that he's going to make in volume one of his, uh, of his um, uh, survey on the Apostles' Creed, which comes in two volumes. I think that was printed by Reformation Heritage Books, and you can find it there on their website. Comes in a whole set with the two volumes on the Apostles' Creed, along with uh, uh, some others, commentary on the Lord's uh, Prayer, and 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 so on, and the covenants. Um, so the reason, again, like I mentioned, I want to go through baptism not because I want to um, take apart pedo baptism or or, or pit pedo baptism against credo baptism or anything like that. Uh, obviously, we could do an episode like that. That's not the purpose of this episode. I want to look at some language that the that the Federal Vision Statement associates with baptism that I think is very important for understanding where they're coming from, the Federal Vision uh, proponents, where they're coming from when it comes to union with Christ, all the benefits and blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, and 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 how they see that in, re in uh, relation to baptism, I think is very illuminating uh, if you're trying to understand the Federal Vision position. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here so that you can have a little bit of a roadmap uh, to see where we're going. Baptism, what does baptism do? According to the Joint Federal Vision Statement, uh, chapter 2 in this book is going to be law-gospel distinction. What is the law-gospel distinction? According to the Joint Federal Vision Statement, there is one, but what is it? And then chapter 3 of this book, justification. What is justification according to the Joint Federal Vision Statement? We're going to look at that at some length, and like I said, we'll get into some Witsius uh, a, a Dutch uh, Reformed theologian uh, of the 17th century when we get to that point. So first, let's look at baptism. Baptism. Is baptism what unites us to Christ? Um, or is baptism a benefit that we have as a result of being united to Christ? Uh, those are two different things, and it, they're they're two different things in a very important in a in a very important way. To say it the first way, to say that baptism is what unites us to Christ would seem to implicate our works in uh, in as being a, a cause of our union with Christ in some way, shape, or form. Um, to say it in the secondary way, or the second way that I put it, that baptism is a, a a blessing and benefit of being in the gospel, of being united to Christ, uh, there's no problems with that, because then baptism becomes an outflow of one's new covenant status, becomes an outflow of one's union with Christ, and a symbol or testimony to one's union with Christ. Whereas if we were to say that baptism is what unites us to Christ, 
we would be bordering there on something like baptismal regeneration. Let's get into this here and see what the Joint Federal Vision Statement has for us on baptism. It says this, We affirm that God formally unites a person to Christ and to his covenant people through baptism into the triune name. And that this baptism obligates such a one to lifelong covenant loyalty to the triune God, each baptized person repenting of his sins and trusting in Christ alone for his salvation. Baptism formally engrafts a person into the church. Remember how we talked about the visible and invisible church distinction in the previous part. That's relevant to this. Baptism formally formally engrafts a person into the church, which means that baptism is into the regeneration they're seeing regeneration as a circumstance that one is brought into rather than as a, a, an, an inwrought work of the Holy Spirit. That time when the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne. So he, he's using, they're using regeneration there as a, a, a word denoting a particular dispensation or administration having to do with time, a, a particular time-bound circumstance or something like that. So I obviously have a couple questions. Uh, these questions can be seen underneath these uh, this paragraph here. Um, and the first question is, if baptism is obedience, if baptism is obedience, which I don't think anybody would disagree that it, that it is, I, I mean, baptism is a command, be baptized, and uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something to be obeyed. And so, if baptism is an expression of obedience to Christ, I think we're justified in further asking the question, is obedience the means by which we are united to Christ? Um, and, and if obedience is the means by which we are united to Christ, we are presupposing that we have the ability to obey prior to union with Christ, which is allegedly the only way and the only reason we can obey rightly in the first place. Because if we're not united to Christ, how can we have evangelical obedience? Uh, how can we have true gospel obedience if we're not united to Christ, yet it's this obedience, it's this it's this right, presumably right, correct, lawful obedience that seems to be the mechanism by which we are united to Christ. So if baptism is obedience, is obedience the means by which we are united to Christ? And I think if we say obedience is the means by which we are united to Christ, that 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 obedience precedes our union with Christ, then then we're in a spot of trouble, because I I don't know about you, but I can't obey the way I ought to obey apart from a vital union with Christ. And so, how is baptism, which is an expression of obedience in the first place, going to be a mechanism? by which we are united to Christ if we need union with Christ in the first place to obey properly. Okay, so that's my first question. And I want to ask that truthfully in the form of a question. I don't really want to interact with with the language here. I'm just asking questions, hopefully to spark you, the viewer, to ask the same questions or to ask similar questions or at least to get your gears churning about the kind of language that's used here. Um, I, I'm going to refer you back to the to part two Regarding this line here, baptism formally engrafts a person into the church. Remember, we made that distinction along with uh, uh, along with uh, Louis Burkhoff, uh in the last part uh, of the invisible visible church distinction. We we discussed you know the invisible and visible church is not those aren't two different churches. They're two different vantage points by which the church is viewed, uh, through which the church is viewed. The invisible church is is like the church as God sees it. It's objective. Uh, it, 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 it does, it cuts through all of the subjective things that we experience as, as finite, limited human beings. The invisible church is the, uh, is the true church consisting of all the elect of God. Okay. Uh, whereas the visible church consists of the elect of God, but it could also consist of people who are not the elect as well. False converts. Uh, people who work their ways into congregations, they're members of the church, uh, the local church, but they they do not uh, they, they they are not vitally united to Christ. A and in other words, they were they were brought into the church uh, mistakenly. They shouldn't have been brought into the church. But again, we can only proceed based on what we know, and we are finite, you know, fallible knowers. And so the visible church is always going to be uh, an approximation, if you will, of the invisible church. 
contrary to what the, the Joint Federal Vision Statement said regarding the church. We looked at that last time in part uh, two. So the question here, the main question here that besets us is, if baptism is obedience, is obedience the means by which we are united to Christ? And it seems like, by the plain language of the of the statement, that yes, baptism, which is an expression of obedience, I don't think anybody would disagree with that, spirit wrought or nay, it is an expression of, of obedience, um, is what unites us to Christ. We affirm that God formally unites a person to Christ and to his covenant people through baptism into the triune name. Now, uh, let's continue here. Uh, this is the denial portion of the Joint Federal Vision Statement on Baptism. We deny that baptism automatically guarantees that the baptized will share in the eschatological church. Um, I'll get to my questions here in a little bit. Let me finish the—I want to ask them now, but let me finish, let me finish the, uh, the statement here. We deny, that, we deny the common misunderstanding of baptismal regeneration— that an effectual call or rebirth or rebirth is automatically wrought in the one baptized. Baptism, apart from a growing and living faith, is not saving, but rather damning. But we deny that trusting God's promise through baptism elevates baptism to a human work. God gives baptism as assurance of his grace to us personally, as our names are spoken when we are baptized. Okay, so... On the one hand, baptism comes before union with Christ because it's it's what it's what causes our union with Christ. It's what brings about our union with Christ. On the other hand, baptism is is a gift given uh, of assurance of His grace. So grace precedes baptism. But how can grace precede baptism if all grace and all the fulfillment of promises to us are in Christ and in union with Him? You see where I'm going with this. So, to get to my questions, is perseverance... Okay, look at the first line. We deny that baptism automatically guarantees that the baptized will share in the eschatological church. Well, this is problematic because if baptism is what unites you to Christ, and if you can then go on to uh, betray that baptism, then you have to uh, deny perseverance of the faith. If, if perseverance comes in union with Christ, if it's a benefit of the gospel, uh, perseverance, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, tulip, right? Perseverance of the saints, the last, uh, the, last, uh, the last letter there in the acronym. If perseverance comes in union with Christ, then how could, and if baptism gets us into union with Christ, then how could baptism not automatically guarantee that the baptized will share in the eschatological church? Okay, I'm just, I'm just reasoning from the words that are used here. Um, I don't agree that baptism automatically guarantees that the baptized will share in the eschatological church, but I do contend that union with Christ does guarantee us a place in the eschatological church. Um, so, it, it, because, and the reason for that is because in union with Christ, we have every blessing and benefit of the gospel. This is what the Reformed Confessions say. It's what John Calvin says uh, with regard to union with Christ, that in union with Christ, we have everything. And if we have everything in union with Christ, is that not perseverance also? Is that not a guarantee to share in the eschatological church? Um, so, how can, how can at once baptism bring us into union with Christ and also not be an infallible indicator of a share in the eschatological church. Um, those two things seem to be at odds here, not reconciled in the statement as far as I can, I can tell. So the question is, is a person in union with Christ guaranteed to share in the eschatological church? If they are, then why are not all baptized persons automatically guaranteed to share in the eschatological church? Uh, I mean, if union with Christ means perseverance of the faith, means that we will persevere, uh, and baptism brings us into union with Christ, then how, how could baptism not automatically guarantee a person a place in the eschatological church? Um, and uh, secondly, the second, the second question, is a growing and living faith not a benefit of union with Christ. 
So look at the second underlined portion. Baptism, apart from a growing and living faith, is not saving, but rather damning. So again, if baptism was what gets us into the door of union with Christ, if baptism is the doorway into union with Christ, and in union with Christ is where we get faith and and all of that, we wouldn't have true saving faith without union with Christ, then how can we have true saving faith logically prior to union with Christ uh, that 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 validates or uh, or uh, uh, realizes the substance of baptism. Um, so these are the, the couple of questions that I have on this uh, denial portion of the Joint Federal Vision Statement. I just don't understand how these things can be held together. Um, you know, systematicians, uh, dogmaticians, uh, biblical theologians work hard to, re- you know, resolve tensions um, that would imply logical contradictions But there's no effort to do—it doesn't seem like there's any effort to do that in the Joint Federal Vision Statement oftentimes, and that the logical tension, if not logical contradiction, is just let to ride, just going by the plain reading of the words, and and, and we can't have that. Um, So let's respond here. I've only asked questions up to this point, but I I would like to respond to the Joint Federal Vision Statement on baptism, hopefully to add clarity— um, but but also to uh, also to bring uh, somewhat of a correction to what has been said in the joint federal vision statement, if I may, uh, and I'm really just going to rely on on scripture to do this, uh, God willing. So, union with Christ cannot. So my response to this is union with Christ cannot be separated from every spiritual blessing. Okay, union with Christ cannot be separated from every spiritual blessing, and this includes adoption, sanctification, and glory. All right, so if we're in union with Christ, we get all of those things. We get adoption, sanctification, and glory. So the question is, if we get all of those things in union with Christ, how in the world could we fail to be members of the eschatological church at the end? Look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Okay, so he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, because we're in Christ, so we're in union with Christ. The, re- the, the reason we have every spiritual blessing is because we are in Christ, seated with him in the heavenly places. Just as, and this is why we're in Christ, just as he chose us, just as God chose us in him. So their election is their joined to the notion of union. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So how could baptism precede union with Christ? In light of Ephesians one three through six, right? How how could we how could we how could we give baptism any sort of causal significance into our in our union with Christ, uh, rather than seeing baptism as an outflow or an outworking of the union we already have in Christ Jesus? Uh, this is this is what John Calvin says. On union with Christ, he says that baptism is a testimony to union with Christ. It witnesses to our union with Christ, um, and, and so and this is this is the language of uh, the confessions as well. Um, that union with Christ comes before everything, and then we have in union with Christ everything, right? So we we get the whole Christ in union with Christ, which means that all of the blessings and benefits that Christ purchased for us in the gospel become ours upon our being united to Christ, right? And there's an eternal aspect and a temporal aspect here. The eternal aspect is we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The election, Our election is not to be divorced from union with Christ, not to be divorced from our inness in him, in Christ, um, on the one hand. And that, and that occurred, but that choosing, that election occurred before the foundation of the world. But the temporal aspect is that that union is applied to us in time, um, and uh, and it's applied to us in time th- through the effectual calling, uh, 
uh, that we our our eyes are opened to the glories and majesties of uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're brought to saving faith um, through an operation of the Spirit in us, and uh, we are uh, we are brought into conscious recognition of our union with Christ uh, and and the reality of our election in Him. And so, uh, lots of things going on in Ephesians one three through six, but. I tried to highlight and underline the main parts here. Every spiritual blessing. Is faith a spiritual blessing? Is baptism a spiritual blessing? Uh, is the Lord's Supper a spiritual blessing? Is the fellowship of the saints a spiritual blessing? Uh, and, and I think we'd have to answer yes to all these things, and then we'd have to see all of those things as as coming to us and, and, and being ours, belonging to us in Christ on account of the fact that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Even that that choosing language in him is the reason for our sanctification. So we have adoption, sanctification, and we have glory uh, because we are, um, uh, we are in Christ who is in the heavenly places, and so we're already guaranteed to be with him, being in him or united to him. So if baptism is what unites us to Christ, yet can also be rendered void, then so too can our union with Christ be rendered void. So, so the question I have for the, the, the Joint Federal Vision Statement framers is, can a person be united to Christ at one point in time, and then let's say five years down the road, not be united to Christ anymore? Uh, is is the nature of apostasy such that a person truly is, you know, uh, vitally united to Christ at one point in time, and that upon their apostasy, they actually, they actually leave, they actually depart from that union. They are separated from that union. They are uh, not united. Because what I would, what I would want to say is that a person who apostatizes was only part of the visible church. They were not engrafted, vitally engrafted into Christ. They were they were only part of the visible church. They looked like a Christian. They smelled like a Christian. They they walked like a Christian and so on. Uh, but upon final analysis, they, they weren't a Christian. So they weren't vitally united to Christ. Because if you're vitally united to Christ, you have true saving faith. You have, uh, you have uh, perseverance, right, unto the end. Um, and, and and you can't lose those things. Where where does perseverance of uh, of the faith sit? Where is it positioned in the scheme in the broader scheme of of federal vision? And so the problem here with with this language of baptism, uh, quite quite uh, unfortunate language. I'm skipping ahead here. How am I doing that? Hold on. Uh, quite unfortunate language, that baptism formally unites a person to Christ and to his covenant people, um, is problematic simply because the implication of that is that union with Christ is, number one, it's contingent upon our works, but given the second part of that statement, we deny that baptism automatically guarantees that the baptized will share in the eschatological church, yet it brings us into union with Christ, seems to suggest that we can actually break our union with Christ. In which case, where is perseverance of the saints in that equation? Uh, so, problematic language that would lead one to conclude that this statement is is closer to something like Lutheranism, um, where uh, you know a person is, um, you know, there's baptismal regeneration, a notion of baptismal regeneration, and then uh, e- even though that person is regenerated um, or brought into the regeneration, they can. Uh, later on depart from that situation or that circumstance, and, and thus there is no perseverance of the saints, uh, or or to say it another way, perseverance of the saints for Lutheranism only lasts as long as a saint determines himself to persevere. Um, and, and so uh, this this statement, I, I don't I don't think this statement materially is is very different from that. Um, and and I don't think that that picture of of being able to break one's union with Christ is altogether different from something you would find in Roman Catholicism um, or the Eastern Orthodoxy 
uh, where you have theosis, but you do have a person who could who could be pursuing theosis and 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 being transformed into uh, uh, godhood or or you know divination, and they can be in that process. And they can truly and really apostatize, so there's no per- perseverance of the saints, as we understand it in in Reformed theology. Uh, and so all of that's all of that's problematic, of course. Um, if this statement is to be taken as a statement that's supposed to be that's supposed to be friendly toward the Westminster Confession of Faith, or at least you know concurrent with it, uh, this I don't see how this could be could reconcile with the Westminster Confession or the theology that sits behind that at all uh, in this in this regard. So let's move to chapter 2, looking at law gospel. This this gets us to the rub of, of a lot of the issues with federal vision. Um, a lot of the issues with federal vision, most people know federal vision and are critical toward federal vision because of its blurring of the law gospel distinction in its own kind of novel law gospel distinction that it sets forth. And so we're going to look at this and then we'll look at justification, which is another uh, big piece here with regard to uh, federal vision. What is the law gospel distinction according to the joint federal vision statement? And we see here uh, that the first part of the statement on law and gospel says this. We affirm that those in rebellion against God are condemned both by his law, which they disobey, and his gospel, which they also disobey. When they have been brought to the point of repentance by the Holy Spirit, we affirm that the gracious nature of all God's words becomes evident to them. So God's all of God's words are, are gracious in nature. Um, the law and the gospel condemn um, because the law and the gospel can both be disobeyed as if both the law and the gospel are commandments. Um, so that brings me to ask the, the simple question, what is the difference between a commandment to be obeyed and the gospel? Is there any difference between those things? And if there's not a difference between those things, then what was the Reformation all about? <laughs> if, I could, if I could just bring it back to, to, to the Reformation, what was the Reformation all about if a commandment to be obeyed and the gospel are not formally distinct uh, with regard to our obedience. Uh, in other words, if the law is something we must obey and the gospel is something we must obey, they are formally the same. And, and there's a, there's no distinction between them. And, and if that's the case, then what was what was the point of uh, of the the fight over the doctrine of justification during the Reformation? Um, if, if those two things are are formally the same. And when I say formally, uh, the formal cause of, of the covenant of works, for example, is obedience. Okay. And uh, the, the formal cause of the covenant of grace is promise. Well, if you, if you take, uh, or we could say it's, uh, we could probably just say, yeah, it's, it's, it would be promise or no, it would be, uh, it would be grace. So if you, the material cause would be promise. So if you take if you take that consideration and that distinction of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace and and you make that distinction the historically understood that the formal cause of the covenant of works is obedience the formal cause of the covenant of grace is grace so if you if you have a statement like this that says essentially that obedience is required by both Making the formal cause the same between covenants of uh, uh, covenant of works and covenant of grace, then what's the real distinction? And if we if we just if we just bring that back to law gospel language, what's the what's the formal distinction between the law and gospel? If o- o- obedience is really the formal cause of our relation to both, um, wh- what's the difference between a commandment to be obeyed and the gospel in that case? Okay, that's so trying just to keep that as a question, so that you have that in the back of your minds as we move on. And then uh, the the second question is, if all God's words are gracious, which is what the last part of the statement says, then how does the Pauline distinction between law and promise work in Galatians 3.18? In Galatians 3.18, we read, for if the inheritance of the law, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is of no longer of promise. It is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Uh, 
So if the if if the distinction between law and gospel, if there really is no distinction between law and gospel, so if if a person uh, that is um, that is a believer, law and gospel are essentially all gospel. It's all gospel. Even the law becomes gospel. The gospel is gospel, obviously. So if that's the case, then then in what sense does does the Galatians three eighteen uh, distinction make any sense? If the inheritance is of the law, and here he's challenging believers, if the inheritance is of the law, well, how, how can Paul say that when to the Galatian believers, the law is the gospel, right? It, it seems that in the text, Galatians 3.18, Romans 4, uh, and, and, and all sorts of other places, that the law-gospel distinction is made very clear and very necessary if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. That means that there must be some law that is not understood as grace or as gospel. And remember, Paul's writing to believers as he's engaging in Galatians 3.18. So he, he's, still, he's still making the distinction, even within the context of, of believers— of a believing community, and he's admonishing them, if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. So a person who is a Christian should still be able to look at the law and distinguish it from the grace of the gospel. Otherwise, Galatians 3.18 makes no sense because it would it would essentially read on, and we'll see this here in a moment, we're going to see this even more clearly, that the statement says that if a person is a believer, then everything God says, including the law, is grace, is gospel to them. We're going to see that in a moment, but but essentially what that implies then is that we'd have to read Galatians 3.18 like this. For if the inheritance is of the gospel, for if the inheritance is of grace, it is no longer of promise. But that, that I mean, that's, that's a, an absurd way to read it. We can't read it that way. There's something real and objective that does not depend upon a believer's circumstance about the law. And, uh, and and that's what the, the classical distinction between law and gospel gets at, is that there really is a difference between the law and gospel. And, and with regard to the law, you have your, your threefold use. You know, the first use and the third use become very relevant to us. The first use is the use whereby our sin is, 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 is revealed to us. We're, we're shown our sin in contrast to the holy law of God, and we're condemned. And, uh, and and therefore we're pressed all the more to look for the grace of God. Once we're a believer, the third use of the law directs us and guides us in terms of what obedience to Christ looks like within the context of the gospel. Yet obedience to Christ is not a condition for our gospel maintenance, for our remaining in the covenant. It's an outflow of our union with Christ and our new covenant membership. And so the second or the third use of the law pertains to believers, but it's still the law. It's still the law. It's holy and good, and it's a guide, and we still wouldn't want to confuse it with the gospel. Okay, and and, and the reason we wouldn't want to confuse it with the gospel is texts like Galatians 3.18. There still really truly is a law, and, but, and it's still good and holy and true, but what we have to realize is we're not justified by that law. We're not made right before God by that law. We're not united to Christ by our obedience to that law. Uh, though that law is to be our guide and to be uh, a revelation of the holiness of God to which we strive as believers uh, and, and by which we express our gratitude toward God for redeeming us through Christ, it's yet not a, a mechanism for our justification and, and it doesn't result in a positive declaration of righteousness for us because that comes from Christ alone and is, it consists in the righteousness, the active and passive obedience of Christ alone. So let's continue on here in uh, Law Gospel. Uh, the second part of their statement on Law Gospel says, We deny that law and gospel should be considered as hermeneutics or treated as such. We believe that any passage, whether indicative or imperative, can be heard by the faithful as good news. So basically, the law is good news, and the gospel is good news, as redundant as that is. The law is good news, and the gospel is good news. And he goes on to say, and that any passage, whether containing gospel promises or not, so even passages that are law, will be heard by the rebellious as intolerable demand. The fundamental division is not in the text, 
but rather in the human heart. And so the distinctive of federal vision with regard to the law gospel distinction is that the law gospel distinction is subjectivized and it's brought inward. And um, now I'm not saying that the believer doesn't change in their relation to the law upon being brought to God through Christ. That's certainly the case, but that's where the third use of the law comes in. Um, but I am saying that the law still remains the law, though it's no longer condemning, uh, though it is good news that God has, has given us the ability to obey it, the law as it demands our duty continues to still be the law, right? It's, it continues to, to still be the law. Otherwise, why would we pray to God, uh, per the Lord's prayer, forgive us of our sins, if the law isn't still the law and thus revealing the reality of our sins to us? Right. Um, um, so let's see. A few questions. Um, if all law is gospel and all gospel is law uh, for the believer, how would obedience following from sanctification be distinguished from justification? And what I'm getting at with this question is what is what is the difference between you know our uh, duty to obey in the scheme of evangelical sanctification, what's the difference between that and justification? Um, because it seems like if if commands just are gospel, right, for the believer, and my obedience, my duty, therefore, to obey just is the gospel, then how, what's the, what's the, what's really the difference here between something like how Roman Catholicism conflates sanctification and justification, our works of obedience in sanctification, and our justification in relation to that, how, how can there be a distinction between those two things if we're not distinguishing between law and gospel? Because sanctification relates to our obedience and our growth and holiness by an operation of the Spirit of God in us, following our union with Christ and following our justification. Justification uh, really only regards the gospel given freely to us and, and received by us according to faith, um, not on account of anything we've done. Um, it gives way to obedience, sure. It's not, it's not brought in by obedience, it's not caused by, obe by obedience, and it's not maintained. Our status as justified persons is not maintained by our obedience. Um, unless the gospel which includes justification and sanctification, unless, unless all of that, unless the gospel just is law, right? Uh, you see how all these wires become, start, start tangling at some point. Another question, if a commandment for our obedience is the gospel, how then are we not co-redeemers with Christ? What, what room is left for the merit of Christ? Or did did Christ only merit some of the gospel, and yet there's more obedience that we have to perform uh, that also constitutes the gospel? Um, if, if a commandment for our obedience is the gospel, how then are we not co-redeemers with Christ? And then the other question, if it's not, uh, if, if the law gospel distinction is not to be used or employed as a hermeneutic or principle of such, then how could the Pauline law gospel distinction inform biblical interpretation at all? In other words, how can we take into consideration, you know, a text like uh, Galatians three eighteen or Romans four five through seven, if we're if we're not allowed to use the law gospel distinction that that Paul himself uses, if we're not allowed to do that, then how can we read the text in light of the text? Right. It says we're not to use the law gospel distinction as a hermeneutic. Well, Paul himself is doing it. I mean, he's he's he has Old Testament theology in in the background as he is doing theology in places like Romans four and Galatians three. They're they're both Old Testament rich documents, understandably so, because it's the first century, and Romans and Galatians constitute a part of the New Testament canon. So he has to be interacting with the Old Testament. Um, and and he he's obviously seeing law in a particular way, and he's seeing gospel or grace or promise or inheritance in a particular way, and that's causing him to draw certain conclusions. Well, if Paul is at liberty to do that, and and if that's Paul's 
method, so to speak, then why is it not ours also? So if it's not to be used as a hermeneutic or principle of such, then how could the Pauline law gospel distinction inform biblical interpretation at all? Okay, and continuing, I want to respond to the law gospel distinction uh, before we move on here to uh, justification. So Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, necessarily implies that no law, no law gives life, none. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, implying that there were there were there there was no law given that could have given life, was none. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So, quick question. If no law gives life, how could law, in any sense, be the gospel? Because we know that the, that the gospel gives life, right? The, the gospel is the very source of our life. So, if, if that's the case then and 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 it's also the case that according to Galatians 3:21 the law doesn't give life how could the law possibly be considered gospel the gospel gives life christ gives life the law does not have the potential to give life it doesn't have the power to give life so how in the world could law be seen as gospel the promise that does give life is given to those who believe. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 22, the very next verse. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Okay, which cannot be, cannot be law. That has to be gospel because law can't give life. So scripture confines all under sin. How? Through law that the promise by faith the freely given gracious promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And then the same distinction exists in Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So the same kind of distinction exists there between works on the one hand, and belief or faith on the other hand. There's a distinction between works and faith that Paul is employing that the Federal Vision Statement seems to be uncomfortable with. Um, And we'll look more at that under the section of justification here in a moment. Um, But going back to Galatians 3.22 and Galatians 3.21, if the law is not able to give life, how can the law be seen as gospel Right, backing up to the the previous section, any passage, whether indicative or imperative, can be heard by the faithful as good news, as gospel. How can the law be gospel if it doesn't give life? Um, and, and that goes for any law. Paul's being very general here. I don't think he is. I don't think his language requires us to restrict this to the Mosaic covenant. This is any law. No law gives life. Right, and so. Uh, so if, if that's the case, then how could law be seen or heard by the faithful as good news? No, good news is what Christ has done for us. Or to say it more specifically, good news is what God has done for us through Christ, full stop. Right? Um, it, it's a, it's a free, free gift. It does not, our obedience is not brought into that picture. Because to the extent that our obedience is brought into that picture, we become contributors and co-redeemers with Christ in that picture. And and that we cannot allow because of the biblical distinctions given. And there's all sorts of other implications. Like we would be saying that something we do in obedience to the law could indeed result in life, right? Which is what Paul denies in Galatians 3.21. And and it's what Paul denies in Romans 4, 4 through 5 with with the distinction between Uh, works and faith. Okay, moving on to justification. Uh, What is justification according to the Joint Federal Vision Statement? It says this, we affirm we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Good. Faith alone is the hand which is given to us by God so that we may receive the offered grace of God. Okay, yeah, it's been, faith has been characterized, uh, metaphorically as the open hand that receives the grace of God. Justification is God's forensic declaration that we are counted as righteous with our sins forgiven 
for the sake of Jesus Christ alone. Well, that's true, but there's another part of our uh, of our justification that's not there, and that's the imputation of Christ's act of obedience, Christ's righteousness to us, right? We're not counted righteous just in virtue of the fact that our sins have been forgiven. We're counted righteous also because of cr- the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. Um, now, I want to make a qualification here that while it's problematic that the, that the statement doesn't include this, and I think there are still some signers of the statement that reject the imputation of Christ's act of obedience to us, but I think Doug Wilson has affirmed the imputation of Christ's righteousness since, and uh, and so I do I do I do not believe that he still uh, would deny the uh, imputation of the act of obedience of Christ. Um, that said, he can agree with this article. He would just say that you know some things uh, should perhaps be added to it. He wouldn't deny what's said here, uh, but he he might say something like it's not it's not as expressive as it could be or it's or it's not as expansive as it could be. It could be expanded to include uh, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ and you know obviously should be expanded to include that. Um, moving on, we deny that the faith which is the sole instrument of justification can be understood as anything other than the only kind of faith which God gives, which is to say a living, active, and personally loyal faith. Now, I, I agree that justifying faith is a lively faith. I mean, we have scripture <clears throat> that tells us everywhere, you know, James 2 is the most famous passage that tells us a faith without works, a, a, a dead faith, is is a useless faith. It's, it's dead, right? That being said, it's not the uh, it's not the liveliness of the faith that results in our justification, so to speak. It's not it's not what faith does that then results in our justification. It's not an operation, properly so called, of faith that results in our justification. We need to ask questions like this when it comes to this kind of language. Is it loyalty that justifies? Because notice how faith is defined here, which which I actually don't necessarily have a problem with if we're speaking of faith in general terms, but if we're speaking about the justifying aspect of faith, this this seems to, again, it seems to read our own loyalty uh, and our own spiritual livelihood into the picture of justification, which I think is a is a is a huge mistake. It, it says personally, it's the faith is a personally loyal faith. So is it loyalty that justifies? Does the loyalty of faith justify, or is it part of what justifies? Because if it is, then again, something we do is read into the picture of why we're justified. If loyalty is not a part, uh, that part of faith which justifies, if it's not, then does faith contain another act whereby we are justified that doesn't have anything to do with loyalty? Uh, I mean, we all agree that true faith is lively faith, but but is it the life that justifies or the content of what that life receives that justifies, namely Christ himself, right? Um, these are very important questions. Uh, Witsius, we'll, we'll get to Witsius here in a moment, but one of the things that Witsius does helpfully, and, and other theologians do it as well, is they make distinctions between the acts of, of faith and... Um, Acts are not to be understood as works. Uh, there's a difference between actus uh, and uh, and opus, uh, act and operation. And uh, act is what is real. Uh, operation is a, a uh, uh, is the um, is the work. I, I guess to say it another way is the work of what is real. <laughs> it's the operation of what is real. So something can be in act. Uh, you know, so for example, a, um, a repose or a restfulness would be an act, but it wouldn't be a work. It wouldn't be an operation per se. So, um, I want to bring some, uh, more updated language into this from Doug himself. And, and he recently wrote an article called living faith has no side hustles. And he's trying to make some clarifying remarks there. And, and there's still some problematic things that he says, and, and I'm just not s- sure how how successful he was at clarifying uh, this aspect of his theology. Um, but he's he's re- he's uh, he's uh, responding to Hicks and Walden. He says a position that Hicks and and Walden want to maintain about the mechanism of this is therefore incoherent. Uh, 
They say the Reformed faith would agree that obedience is an essential characteristic of faith, but to say that its obedience is an essential characteristic of faith's instrumentality is unorthodox. In other words, what, what they're saying is, according to Doug Wilson, is correct. Doug Wilson disagrees with it, but it's fundamentally correct about the Reformed tradition and about the doctrine of justifying faith. To say that its obedience is an essential characteristic of faith's instrumentality is unorthodox. So while everybody would agree that obedience is an essential characteristic of faith, it's not that essential characteristic of faith that is justifying, or it's not that particular act of faith that is justifying. And then he says, but this is to say that obedience is an essential characteristic of faith, but that it must leave this essential characteristic behind. Well, it it, it doesn't say that. Uh, it just says that this essential characteristic or this particular act of faith is not that which justifies. Just like, you know, love, our love for God and our love for neighbor is an act of faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. So it has to, true love has to be an act of faith. But we wouldn't say that our love is the instrument of justification, right? Um, so Doug's response to them is, but this is to say that obedience is an essential characteristic of faith, but that it must leave this essential characteristic behind, thereby ceasing to be what it is when it undertakes to do anything related to resting and receiving. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have to leave that behind. It's just to say that there are several essential characteristics or acts of faith, only one of which is principle, and only one of which is justifying, uh, and that is the receptive act of faith, which is not properly an operation. It's not properly a work. Um, so the question, the question is not. Doug is, I think, mischaracterizing the the issue. the The question is whether the obedience of faith justifies. Does the obedience of faith justify? It, the question is not whether or not faith results in faithfulness. The question is not whether or not obedience is a, a necessary act of faith. The question is whether that particular act is what justifies. Which act of faith justifies? And here's where I want to turn to Herman Witsius. I think he's very helpful. Again, this is uh, volume one. I do not have this verbiage up on the screen. I'll just read it to you. Those uh, who are listening on the podcast uh, will be able to hear it. You who are watching the YouTube video, um, you won't be able to read it, but you'll be able to hear it. So um, if you have to rewind, do so. He says this. This is uh, page 37 of that same volume that I just showed on, on your screen. Volume 1, Sacred Dissertations on the Apostles' Creed. And he says, It seems proper in the meantime to remark that amongst the various acts of faith, so there he's talking about the various acts of faith, which we are about to describe, there is one which holds the principal place and in which, as it unites us to Christ and justifies us, we apprehend the essence and formal nature of faith to consist. This must be carefully attended to, particularly in the matter of justification, lest several expressions of love, which in different ways are involved in the exercise of faith, should be rashly numbered among the causes of our justification. And I think what the Federal Vision Statement does, and I think even what Douglas Wilson has done in the past, and I would love to see him uh, clarify this, but I think what has been done in these statements and in these blog articles and in these videos is that these several acts of faith have been rashly numbered among the causes of our justification, at least by way of implication. And part of that is because, you know, he insists on using this language of lively faith, which on the one hand is not wrong, you know, loyal faith, that's not wrong to use that kind of language. And there's definitely a proper way in which we can use that language. But is that loyalty the aspect of faith that is justifying? Does it play any part in our justification? Because if it does then it follows that our loyalty is the means by which we are justified, in which case we are indistinguishable from Roman Catholics. Indistinguishable. If you read the Roman Catholic Catechism on justification, you see that sanctification and justification are blurred together. Justification is sanctification, so to speak, according to the Roman Catholic Catechism. 
Okay, so he says, this must be carefully attended to. There's one chief act that um, that unites us to Christ, that justifies us. Uh, it's, it's that by which we apprehend the essence and formal nature of, of faith to consist. And he says, this must be carefully attended to, particularly in the matter of justification, lest several expressions of love, which, and, and these are rightfully attributed to faith, love, um, uh, a hunger and a thirsting for righteousness and things of that nature, uh, those are all rightfully termed acts of faith, but are those the acts which justify? And he says, we need to be very careful not to rashly number those acts of faith that uh, involve our operation, our works. We need to be careful not to number those among justifying acts. There's only one act of faith that justifies. And uh, so I want to read Witsius on that particular act. He says, this hunger and thirst, he just treated of hunger and thirst as an act of faith, is succeeded by a receiving of Christ for justification, sanctification, and complete salvation. So in other words, what he's saying is we rest in Christ, not only for our justification, but also for our sanctification and complete salvation, the whole picture. He says, this is the fifth act of faith, and indeed its formal and principal act, that of receiving Christ. Our Heavenly Father, he says, freely offers his Son, and the Lord Jesus Christ freely offers himself with all his benefits and the fullness which dwells in him to the sick and weary soul, saying, Behold me, behold me. And then a few lines down, he says, By this act, this act of receiving Christ, Christ becomes, so to speak, the peculiar property of the believing soul. And he goes on, By apprehending Christ in this manner, he is united to him. The believer is united to him. And being united to Christ, he is considered as having done and suffered those very things which Christ, as his surety, did and suffered in his stead. When this is rightly observed, it is easy to understand how we are justified by faith in Christ. But what Witsius does is he says this receiving of Christ is the only act of faith that is truly justifying. The other acts of faith that he mentions, knowledge, which isn't a complete faith. It's just, it's just simply uh, uh, intellectual apprehension of that which is to be known. Uh, assent, hungering and thirsting, uh, and love are all acts of, of, of saving faith, but they're not justifying acts of saving faith. The fifth act that he mentions is, uh, is receiving of Christ. Uh, for justification, sanctification, and complete salvation. That's the only act that justifies. That doesn't require that we leave all the other acts behind. It just requires that we understand those other acts not to be justifying acts of the one saving faith. Um, and so understanding how uh, a single virtue like faith can uh, can result or, or issue out in several acts, um, I think is very helpful. That's what Witsius does. I think that's I think that's pretty normal, uh, a pretty normal understanding in in Reformed theology generally. Uh, even in the Second London Confession, you know, it's, it speaks about, you know, faith never being alone, uh, that it's always accompanied by works, but yet the Confession also would say that it's, it's not by our works, it's not by our deeds, it's not by anything wrought in us, even, by the Holy Spirit. It's not by any experiential aspect of the Christian life that we are justified that it is 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 only on account of Christ, the object of the receptive act of faith. And so, guys, hopefully this was helpful. Um, and uh, this slideshow was provided by SlidesGo and Flaticon. Uh, the images, infographics were by FreePick. Um, hopefully this was helpful. If it was helpful, please uh, share it. If it was helpful for you, maybe it was. Maybe it'll be helpful for somebody else. This is the last in the Federal Vision series. You know what? There's more that we could do about that statement. Uh, I could. I could have been a lot more meticulous, but I wanted to hit some of the more important points, some of the clearer areas of the statement that couldn't really be uh, left up to a whole lot of a whole lot of debate. I, I know we've dealt with some unclear language. Um, through the statement, um, it, it's it's almost impossible not to in the joint federal vision statement. There's a lot of uh, ambiguity there, uh, but I, I nevertheless tried to give the main points here and interact with those main points. And hopefully, this 
uh, is helpful in understanding uh, the bigger picture of what's going on with Federal Vision. Uh, God bless you guys. Hopefully you have a wonderful rest of your time.